Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about Venus once again and about another paper that seems to justify what we originally discovered a few weeks ago. It looks like Venus possesses phosphine gas after all, the gas that at least here on planet Earth is uniquely produced by different types of life. It's never really produced by anything else. But what's even more shocking is that we originally got this data 42 years ago. In other words, we've always had this data, but it was just recently rediscovered. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, starting with this beautiful animation that was created by NASA around six to seven years ago, demonstrating how one day we could actually go to Venus and even send actual astronauts there to explore, discover, and study the atmosphere of this beautiful planet. As you see in the simulation, it uses the beautiful invention from around 100 years ago. It uses zeppelins. Very, very large balloons with actual probes attached to the bottom of them and the solar panels on the top of the balloon itself. In this case, the astronauts would be sitting in the cabin right here, with the large section behind this being the escape rocket that they would use to return back to Earth. And although it might sound crazy, this plan could definitely work because the technology behind all of this is already available to us, we're only just lacking the money to make this happen. Here's actually what the cabin might look like, and you can see there are two astronauts doing all kinds of scientific studies, and at the same time communicating with the scientists back on Earth. And then, once they're ready to go home, all they have to do is launch the rocket, and of course, return back to Earth using a very similar method to how they got to Venus to begin with. So all of this sounds pretty easy, pretty incredible, and of course is something that we should be doing, but it hasn't been done, and honestly in the last few years, looks like NASA has lost all interest of going back to Venus. But that's of course until now, until we actually found signs of potential life there. And the first person to propose going back to Venus, and the first person to might actually do this, is of course the person we discussed in the last Venus video, Peter Back the CEO behind a company known as Rocket Lab that launches satellites in a similar fashion to SpaceX uh, by Elon Musk. But that's of course the possible future. Let's talk about the past for a second, specifically about how we used to explore Venus regularly and how we used to launch missions there pretty much every single year. One of such missions was known as the Pioneer mission, or more specifically Pioneer Venus Multiprobe, because the Pioneer mission itself included several missions and submissions in it, and it also lasted for something like 44 years, with the main goal initially being visiting the Moon and then going to other planets including Jupiter, Saturn, and later Venus. And the Pioneer Venus Multiprobe was extremely interesting because it was actually a combination of the orbiter with four different probes, three small ones like you see right here and one large one in the middle that contained seven different instruments on the inside, including what's known as mass spectroscopy instrument, whose main purpose is to distinguish what sort of molecules and atoms are present in a sample. The way this apparatus works is pretty simple. First of all, we take the sample of whatever it is we're measuring, so for example, the air in the atmosphere of the planet, and then ionize all of the particles in it, we turn them into ions. In other words, these particles are now going to be affected by magnetic forces. We then accelerate these particles along some sort of a channel and cause them to suddenly turn using a magnet as you see right here. Depending on the mass of the particle, certain particles will be able to turn much easier, but other ones, heavier ones, will not be able to turn as fast. I guess the best analogy here would be cars turning. A much heavier car is going to have trouble turning and will end up not turning as much as the much lighter car, which in this case will mean that the lighter object will end up moving on the bottom here, whereas the heavier object is going to be moving higher up. And as we start detecting where these ions end up landing, we can then start measuring the total molecular weight based on the measurements of something else we already know the weight of. So for example, let's just say because we know the molecular weight of oxygen, we can take ionized oxygen, do this to the uh, molecules of that oxygen, and measure where it's going to land. And then we compare this to some of the other things we throw in here, which will eventually create something like this. Here we have the molecular weights of everything that was detected by this probe in the atmosphere of Venus, because as you might have guessed already, one of the probes was doing exactly that in the atmosphere of Venus back in 1978. 
And by looking at this old data from 1978, the scientists discovered that there were a few molecules in there that were not really well analyzed. In other words, some of the things that were originally detected by the Venusian probe did not initially make sense and were not really analyzed to the extent where the scientists knew exactly what they were. And so having looked at this old data once again, the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description below were able to quite definitively say phosphine was most likely present back then as well. Specifically right here at 33.992 AMU, which stands for Atomic Mass Unit, also known as Dalton, the measurement seems to match to the measurements of uh, phosphine, which is exactly 33.99. Seven. And although the scientists behind this paper also mentioned that this is a very similar molecular weight or atomic weight of H2S, which is hydrogen sulfide, the original reports did not talk about phosphine or measure phosphine or actually even phosphorus at all. But in this analysis, they also discovered that uh, phosphorus was also there as well. And you can see that they found phosphorus in these samples as well. And although this is not maybe the best confirmation of the existence of phosphine, the amount discovered here is to some extent very similar to the amounts discovered in the previous paper we've discussed a few weeks ago. Which altogether does mean that phosphine and phosphorus might indeed be present in the atmosphere of Venus. And if so, this is a huge mystery, for one very important reason mentioned in this paper. Venus has what's known as an oxidizing atmosphere. It has a lot of hydrogen peroxide, it has a lot of methane, it has a lot of nitrous oxides. All of these molecules generally would break up anything with certain chemical properties such as what phosphine has. In other words, phosphine in general should not be able to survive without combining into something completely different. And this of course once again means that either A, phosphine is produced in some really strange way we've never even thought of before, so it's chemically produced by something else unusual, which also means that maybe we should go and figure out what's causing the creation of phosphine here, or B, more likely it's created by some sort of a organism. So the data from 42 years ago from 1978 seems to confirm the discovery from just a few weeks ago. And all of these reasons are of course an excellent opportunity for us to go and see what's going on there. Now luckily at least one entrepreneur is already interested in going there, but we need organizations like NASA, organizations like the ESA, European Space Agency, JAXA, the Japanese, or the Chinese space agencies to go there and find something else to either prove or disprove the original discovery. In other words, I think we would all like to see this being a reality. Let's bring back the Zeppelins, let's bring back the technology from hundreds of years ago and make it work on Venus, and most importantly, let's eventually try to make the iconic Star Wars Cloud City a reality on Venus. That would be the ultimate achievement for humanity, at least for the 21st century. Let's hope that someone makes this happen, because seeing this would be absolutely epic. But anyway, so it's a very interesting study, it's a very interesting rediscovery from old data, and all of this does seem to indicate that something unusual is happening in the atmosphere of Venus. We will talk more about this in one of the future videos, and we'll actually discuss a few more ideas that I didn't mention in this video. Make sure to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt I'm also wearing right now as well. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.